Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the session on science communication. And I'm actually really thrilled that WACE is having a session specifically on science communication. It's a thing that almost all of us do in some respects, but it tends to get moved to the periphery of what we actually do as scientists or as journalists or as other people in the field. And that's really unfortunate because science communication is so critical to what we do. It's so critical to everything that's in our field. Science communication is really how we communicate results in science to policymakers. It's how we translate research to, to, to actual outcomes. And if we miss that, those important connections, then it has so much less impact for our research. And in addition to that, science communication is so much about storytelling. It's about telling our stories to policymakers. It's about telling our stories to students to get new people into the field. It's about telling our stories so that people can understand what we do and who we are, and that our science is really a part of our um, identity sometimes, or um, a lot of the things we do in terms of teaching and bringing communities and people who might not have experience with polar research into the polar research community. And so I'm really excited to hear all of the talks that we have. We have an excellent lineup of talks. And our first talk is going to be Marlo Garnsworthy. And so if I can ask you to share your screen and I will mute myself and I will try and give you a couple minute warning. Oh, and I would like to encourage everyone to make vigorous use of the chat. If you wanna have questions answered after the talks, we can go through some of the chat questions. We can also return to various themes during the discussion afterwards, which is one of those unique things that I've always enjoyed about WACE. So please, Marlo, go ahead. Thanks, Jeremy. Well, I mean, that couldn't be a more perfect introduction for what I'm going to be talking about today, which is the science hero's journey or using storytelling in science outreach. Um, so first of all, thank you, WACE uh, Committee. You've done an amazing job getting this conference going under these circumstances. And thank you, conveners, as well. Uh, yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, and I think most of you know me, I am an author, illustrator, editor, writing teacher. I've been working in publishing for over 20 years, and I'm also an outreach officer. I've been to Antarctica twice on um, research cruises so far, and I'm always looking for my next journey, so hit me up. I'm just going to get that in there right now. Okay, so I'm going to talk about storytelling in science outreach. So last year, if you're at WACE, um, you heard me talk about what I considered the, the polar psychom problem. Um, it's easy to draw people in because it's Antarctica, it's cool, it's really beautiful, there are penguins. The cons are that, you know, we're all talking about difficult subjects. It's difficult to retain public attention. Polar melting seems like something that's far away. It's, uh, it raises anxiety so people get to that point where they start to tune out. Obviously, the, the eternal science communication problem is that it's difficult to convey your science in layperson's terms when you're used to speaking about it in uh, your own terms. And you may be confident, lacking confidence, it's time consuming, etc. So your goal in science communication is to show your, why your science matters. You want to connect with each person and show why it mat should matter to them, OK? Um, I strongly feel that that's about turning facts or data into truth, truth or emotion. So this is the uh, what we call the hero's journey. Um, this is a very ancient storytelling structure. And while, you know, we all have a call to adventure when we go to Antarctica and we definitely face challenges and occasionally temptations. Um, and probably at, at times we feel like we're entering the abyss when equipment breaks or sinks to the bottom of the ocean or whatever. Um, it's really a little bit complex for what we want to use in our science communication. So I prefer a structure that I call the mountain climber. We have a goal, we have to climb a steep mountain, and then we have a reward at the end. So as I'm sure you learned in school, and as you've noticed every time you've read a book, or seen a movie or anything else, strong stories start with a beginning, an exciting hook. Um, the middle, it's rising tension. There's a crisis point. I'm going to leave that to a little bit later. 
climax. It's like the, the pinnacle, the, the highest point, the most tension. And then there's a, a falling action, falling tension, and a resolution to complete the story. I know you're all scientists, and so you like graphs, and so I'll graph this out for you. Um, the top graph is the arc, the, the shape of your science story. So once again, it's that mountain shape. You want to think about starting people off with a you know calm feeling, raising the tension to like a pitch, and then bringing it back down again at the end. Um, in terms of pacing and duration, the bottom graph shows uh, the amount of time you should spend in each section of your science story. Um, for our purposes, the crisis point is actually going to come a little closer to the, to the climax. Science stories can take many, many forms. Kev's in the audience there. This is an animation that he made. Um, there's blogs, there's graphics, uh, creative writing, really anything that you can think of. Peter, there you go. There's your ice drop. Your, Tweet, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so it's really anything. Um, if I had a whole workshop, I could teach you how to use the structure I'm talking about in each of these forms. Uh, but today I am really going to be focusing on how you can apply it to public talks and school visits, because I think that's something that many of you are going to be probably be doing. So this is, I'm going to share with you how I do my public talks. I frequently speak to um, everyone from elementary school children to, um, to adult lay persons about uh, polar melting um, and my expeditions that I've been on. So I'm gonna sort of show you the structure that I use and I'm going to, um, I would really love it if you try to use this, own, this structure in your own work. Um, afterwards, contact me if you want to see actual talks that I've done and see how it's, it's fully applied. But I totally invite you to, to copy the structure because it works. It engages people, it keeps them engaged until the end and it leaves them thinking. So the beginning, you start with excitement and wonder. These are the emotion, emotions you want to evoke. So think about where did you go to in Antarctica or what place are you studying if you haven't been there? What's that experience like? What's it like to get there? What's it like to be there? How does it feel? How exciting is it? In the middle, you want to start to introduce your science. You know, why are you there? Why, why are you studying this? What are you really doing? It's okay. So These are a couple of pages from a children's book I uh, wrote and illustrated after my last um, expedition to Iceberg Alley, east of the, the um, Antarctic Peninsula. I realized quickly that uh, a lot of people didn't really even know how icebergs form. So I started at the beginning. It starts with snow and snow and snow and snow. Snow compacts and crystals grow, becoming sugary granular ice, then hard crunchy fern, then dense clear glacial ice over thousands of years. Never seen fern in a children's book before, have you? There you go. For all you fern dorks out there. Um, so these are some other things I always include in my presentations. A map of Antarctica, um, to show people the size of Antarctica because people really, really don't understand how big it is. When they find out, they get a big surprise. They don't know that ice flows. So always go back to the basics. If you saw Sammy's talk yesterday, um, you will have noticed that she gave a very excellent introduction to what she was gonna talk about, going back to the basics. So always start there. Then move on to people and processes. Show processes and show people engaged in the processes. You start to explain your science in very simple terms. Always use appealing images. Don't talk about something that you're finding. Actually show how cool and how beautiful and interesting it really is. Um, also, you keep your slides very, or your, your materials very, very simple. Um, I know scientists like to jam a lot of information into their slides. Yeah, I can see you grinning. They, and that's great. But when you're talking to the general public, you need to keep it super simple so that they can focus on what you're saying, not what they're seeing on the screen. Once again, keep it super simple, no jargon, especially when you're reaching conclusions about what your science is going to do. Just a simple few points and 
in simple language that everyone, a child or an adult can understand. Next, crisis point. So I didn't really touch on this, but this is the point in a story. Um, and I challenge you from now on to, to every story you read or every movie you see to think, what is this crisis point? It's something you may not be aware of in storytelling. This is the point where I really start to dig a little deeper and I kind of poke the audience a little bit. I start to show why they really, really need to be not just engaged in the fact that this is cool, it's Antarctica, cool stuff's going on, but they really need to think about it a little bit deeper. Um, this is a point where I need you to show why your science matters to the audience. Um, obviously, if you're in coastal regions or you can link uh, polar melting to uh, to your local region that's really really ideal. Uh, these images on the right hand side here are a town close to where I live where we're already experiencing flooding during um, high tides and um, big storms. And the resolution, uh, this is, is the point at which you want to take people down they've, they've already been spurred into that sort of painful angsty place and so you want to bring them back down again and empower them this is hard stuff it's really difficult for people to kind of face up to what's going on i think people really are starting to but if you empower them they're going to walk away from this experience not only you know excited about what you're doing but feeling like they can make a difference so obviously, you know, you can elicit some of the typical responses that we can all, um, the, the typical choices that we can all make. You know, we can all have individual actions, but really the most important is communicating about polar melting with other people and inspiring people to vote for candidates who will act on climate. We all know those are the things that are really gonna make a difference. And finally, you wanna finish your story your talk with bringing it back to how fun, how cool this place is. You're a total badass and there are penguins and it's Antarctica. What's not to love, right? And I don't know how I'm going for time, but um, I want you to leave, want to leave you with this thought that no matter whether you're writing a blog or giving a talk or um, whatever science communication activity you're doing, the beginning of your science story, it makes a promise. The ending has to deliver on the promise you make. Look for this in the stories you read. Look for this in the stories you see in movies, etc. So what you want to think is, where do you want to end in your story? What's the conclusion you want your audience to reach? Think about the ending and then work backwards to write your beginning. The middle is kind of like following the thread, touching on the thread, kind of reconnecting with it all the way through. But this is what you want to do. Think about where you want to end and start your story to reach that begin, that ending. Um, thank you once again. If you need um, examples of public talks that I've done, please reach out to me and uh, I look forward to connecting with you more and answering your questions. Thanks very much, Marlo. I'll ask the next speaker, Kia, if she would like to share your screen and we can take a few questions as we transition over. Any questions for Marlo? We can also talk a little bit more in the discussion session. And I will tell you that um, in terms of your first model of story building, I particularly like the supernatural intervention. I feel like that's often seems like a part that I need in my research. I tell you, I, I was thinking the same thing when I saw that and I put that gra in the graphic. I, I just um, I had a bit of a laugh to myself because I thought about how that's actually happened. It seems to happen on expeditions, especially when you see the northern, the southern lights on the last night of your uh, coring and stuff like that. <laughs> and I once read in a paper um, a long mathematical derivation in the middle of it. There was a statement and then a miracle happens. <laughs> All right, we have our next talk up right now. And this is going to be Kia. And I'm pretty sure we're all supposed to get out our pens now. So yeah, share. For sure. So that'll be that'll be at the end, but um, <laughs> bear with me here. So I'm Kaya Riverman. Um, 
I think I know lots of you, but for who I don't, um, I'm a postdoc currently at NYU. Um, I use geophysics and remote sensing to study ice sheets and ice shelves. Um, but today I'm gonna be jumping in a little bit to the science communication that I do. Um, and Marlo says I'm supposed to um, start with where I want us to end. So where I want us to end is for you to have the percolating thoughts of how could I start sharing my science in maybe a non-traditional way um, and I hope I can give you some tools to, to get there. So for the last two years, um, I have been drawing small silly cartoons of glaciers um, and putting them on the internet. Um, and this came actually from Waste Workshop. So Cryotunes was born at Waste Workshop two years ago. Um, and what it is, is a Twitter account where I occasionally, not particularly regularly, um, put cartoon summaries of talks that I've been to or papers that I've read online. Um, I'm a really visual learner. The way that I learn is by um, seeing figures um, and drawing myself. And so in my own notes, when I'm at a meeting or a conference, I draw pictures of what I'm learning about. And kind of the only way for me to like actually understand and actually remember later a talk that I've seen is to draw a little cartoon of it. And so kind of all the way through my education, this is something that I've done. Um, and it wasn't until Waste Workshop two years ago that someone said, those are cool. Um, and I kind of had the thought of maybe other people would like to see these things that I am truly drawing for myself. Um, and so I've started doing that. Um, what I wanna go through is um, a couple of kind of influential minds that have kind of subsequently influenced um, how I think about sharing the science. Um, so Malcolm Gladwell is an author, um, podcaster extraordinaire, um, and he's perpetually sharing the importance of specificity. Um, I think the example he gives is imagine um, a generic rock song about love. Um, it's hard to imagine, right? And you probably can't think of one, um, but, but instead like a, super terrible country song um, about a, a man whose brother has died and he now goes out and drives his dead brother's truck as a way to feel connected to his brother, right? That's like a, a very specific song with a very specific emotional response that hits you in a soft spot. And I think we can actually approach science communication from a similar standpoint of specificity is where it's at. And with the stories we tell and with the images that we show conveying not hey, here's this entire talk, but hey, here's one idea. Here's one very specific idea from this talk because that's what people remember and what people have like an emotional response to. And so what does that mean actually for, for drawing cartoons of talks? I see that as um, this specific message that we can convey can either relate to a method. So in the case of um, a talk yesterday, we learned about how um, penguin remains and old shells can tell us something about viscoelastic rebound. This is a talk that Scott Braddock gave, right? And so that method, right? That we can use penguin remains to study um, the rebound rate of the earth. I find really compelling. And so I think sharing that is valuable. Alternatively, it might be that the actual results of the study, um, not the methods in particular, um, are what convey meaning. Um, so Matt Hoffman last year at Waste Workshop gave a talk that that highlighted how glacial meltwater um, from Queen Maud land um, may have some influence on how CDW gets under the Pilchnerani. And so conveying that idea, the results um, within a cartoon. I think the next influential mind um, I wanna think about is Casey Neistat. He's a YouTuber and filmmaker. Um, and he's all about this idea that tools don't matter. That the story that you're telling is far more important than the medium with which you're communicating it. You know, so for a filmmaker, that might mean, um, you know, you could film a movie on an iPhone. And if the content of the movie was impactful, then it's going to resonate much more than, you know, the world's fanciest camera telling a bland story. And so what that means for me is that the process by which I make these cartoons, I think, is not important. Um, here it is, if you're really curious. Um, but what's more important is getting that message out there. And so I think... Um, technology and what you own and your skill sets within technology, people see as a big impediment towards sharing their science. Um, and I would argue that if you have a phone with a camera and a whiteboard, you can draw pictures that will make an impact. Um, whether that means putting them 
actually on the internet or just incorporating them into your own talks, um, summarizing your key results in graphics form, in a little cartoon form um, for people like me who learn that way. Um, and then maybe the last little piece of advice I wanna throw out there is holding a beginner's mind. And this is a thing that Zen Buddhists are all about. Um, it's the idea that um, say you're a, a, a potter who's, who's making a cup. Um, if you are a skilled potter and you sit down to make a mug um, and it goes terribly, you might feel some shame or disappointment surrounding that in the way that your first time sitting down at a potter's wheel, if it goes terribly, you just have a good laugh about it, right? And holding on to that beginner's mindset of not having expectations of the outcome throughout the process of learning a skill like science communication, I think is key. And so for me, what that means is I draw silly little cartoons and I put them on the internet and people might like them or not, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it to get the message out there. Um, and then the rest flows from there. Um, so yeah, hold the beginner's mind because I think it's easy to see um, the Jill Peltos of the world who are amazing. Jill is a grad student at University of Maine who is both a scientist and a fabulous artist. Her work has been featured on the cover of Time Magazine. Um, and I think it's easy to look at examples like this and have it be the inhibitor for you stepping out the door and trying a little bit of science communication yourself. Um, and I would argue that um, holding on to this beginner's mindset where you're not, where you don't have expectations of being on the cover of Time Magazine from day one, um, can release us from that and allow everyone to do whatever um, speaks to them to communicate their science, whether that's making cakes that are shaped like ice shelves or writing poems that you, you do you, whatever um, medium speaks to you and then putting that out there in the world um, is just very meaningful and has been um, impactful in my career up to this point. So here's your challenge. You've got two minutes, a little less, minute and a half. Um, and what I want you to do is on that piece of paper that you've already pulled out, draw a tiny little cartoon, or if that's not you, write a tiny little poem um, that summarizes um, your most recent work. So maybe it's the talk that you gave here at Waste Workshop. Um, if, yeah. So I'm gonna give you one minute and then, so draw your little cartoon. Um, have a clear message that you're conveying with it and have no expectations of beauty, uh, go. And you actually have 45 seconds. You have 45 seconds, go. Five seconds. Okay, I know that's not very much time, but that just means that it doesn't have to look good. If you're willing, hold yours up to the camera. Awesome. And now I want you to think about how much um, more people could have potentially gotten out of your talk if they had seen this figure right at the end. Um, so let's make all of our lives a little bit easier and start including little graphic visualizations like this um, in our talks as well. They don't have to be good. Cool, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Kaya. Uh, that was really inspiring. And any quick questions for Kaya as we transition over to our next speaker that Brent will introduce. And Johnny, do you wanna get ready? Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. So up next, we have Indrani Das from Lamont. Uh, I 
don't seem to have her title, but I'm sure it will be an inspiring talk nonetheless. Uh, and so with that, it looks like Indrani is ready to go. Hello, everyone. I'm Indrani Das. I'm a research professor at Le Monde. And this talk, the title is very general. It's Thwaites Glacier and Ice Ocean Interaction. At the grounding line, I have to move the zoom into a little bit so I can see my screen. And I do a lot of outreach activities, the science communication. And recently I've started working with on the STEAM fields, which means that I, I have started incorporating art into my outreach activities. And these art and illustrations, they're usually, I, I do them myself. And sometimes my sister who is an act, actual illustrator helps me with some of the slides. But in this talk, it's mostly, I will show you a few slides of how I interpret my signs um, using watercolor or oil, oil painting. A few of the slides will have those. Those are all my illustrations. And okay, it's the next slide. So we all do outreach in some form or the other. Well, most, of, most of us scientists do that. And I do this, I have done this in the past and now I'm doing this as a part of profit. So it also becomes an NSF requirement for the broader impacts. And I feel that it's so necessary to communicate science to the general public. So when I do outreach, I usually work with three groups of people and I like to know who my audience is. For example, we, I, can, I also work with informed audience who have a very strong science background, but not necessarily glaciologists. So they could be engineers. Oh, okay. The engineers, science, uh, science journalists, faculty, students from other disciplines. And when I talk about my science I, to these people, I also include results and data, not the processes, but generally showing my data and they appreciate because they understand the process. They understand how data looks like and I show comparisons. So it shows them the process of coming to a conclusion. Then I also talk, talk to K-12 students and these are students that come at different age ranges. I don't go into any of the details of my methods or data into it for these students. I talk about you know, how, what Antarctica is, like very general, show them lots of pictures and photographs and stories about the field work. It's a way to get them motivated to take up the STEM fields. And then the third group of people I work with is the informed, is the people, the general audience uh, who are informed about climate change and sea level rise but doesn't necessarily know much about ice sheet processes. So here I will show uh, a few things. Uh, I talk in general about Antarctica, show them, again, show them a lot of pictures and photographs from the field and talk a little bit about ice sheet processes, but I don't go into the data or results too much. And like I said, this is part of my STEAM activities. A slide that I generally keep for all levels of audience is this global sea level rise. Uh, for the past 100 years. This is one of my illustrations that I did. And uh, this is a 100 year old woman named Tula. And this is how she, this shows that in the past 100 years that she has been alive, this is how far the uh, sea level has, global sea level has risen. So six to nine inches. And I also talk about how nonlinear this is. So just something I forgot to tell you is this talk that I'm giving you today is something I give to very informed level of people, people who already are, are engineers have from a different background or scientists from a different background. So the, here I'll show an example of data and let's see if it works. So, and then I introduce Antarctica. And also because this is just compressed in eight minutes, usually my talks will be 40 minutes. And, uh, I will pad them with many, many examples and I slowly get to the points that I'm trying to make. But here I will just fast forward showing you the important slides and we can have a discussion whether it worked. So I show this very informed level of people uh, who are again, scientists and engineers in a different field or maybe even journalists. And also my talks for this kind of things also, in, in, also involve artists. So here I, I introduce Antarctica and I show that this is West Antarctica. And if I'm talking about Thwaites, I show them why Thwaites is important. So this is an area that's changing really rapidly. And you can see this is a Shepherd et al. paper from 2018. And this shows elevation changes or in simply put, this is the mass change over West Antarctica. So this is why Thwaites and Pylon and glaciers are important because this is changing so rapid, rapidly in West Antarctica. 
And then there'll be many, many slides before I come to this slide where I introduce what it, what it means to what grounded ice and ice shelves are. And because I work on ice shelves and grounding uh, the regions close to grounding zone, I have to introduce this very carefully. So here and this uh, this figure, I have something I have painted and I use this only for very informed audiences because this is a little bit complicated. Children will not understand it. This is show this shows an ice shelf. And then that's the bathymetry underneath. So this is the floating part. So there is a hole in between, which shows that this is the ocean. And if you can imagine that the ice is grounded over there. And then that brings me to this figure, which is Pritchard it's all, it all's like very famous ocean temperature. And I talk about, I say that, hey, look, this is the ice shelf on the, and there is the ocean in between. And the ocean is directly in contact with the ice shelf and the grounding line. And why it's important is because of the ocean temperature. So here, Without going into details of this, I say, just remember that pink is warm and um, blue is cold. So if you remember, Twitz was over here in West Antarctica. It's surrounded by ocean that is warm. And warm ocean and ice, which is in contact with the ice shelf, is not going to go well for any ice on, any on, on, on this planet. So it's just going to melt. So that's why it's important that we understand why West Antarctica is vulnerable. And I hope that figure was, this painting I did was useful. Two and minutes, then, Oh, okay. How many, two minutes? Okay, um, and then I talk about the ice shelf, how the two ways that ice shelf can be uh, melts and talk about the grounding line and the grounding line retreat. I show them a data, a piece of data. This is how we use radars to map. So remember that my audience is audience consists of people who know about science already. So that here I show them anything in the grounding line over here, this is the grounding line, and this is the, ret the retreat of the grounding line. The radar can map what is the temperature at the, this is the ocean, interior of the grounding line, the radars can map, the, uh, map whether there is, the ice is warm at the base or not. So here, warmer colors indicate that the ice is warm at the grounding line. And this is an example from Twaits and I'm working on this. This is a paper in present uh, that I uh, will be submitting soon. And I'll just skip that. Oh, I'll just go through a little. So this is how the grounding line retreats from 2014 and the black is the 20, 2009 through 10. So you can see that there are four regions where the grounding, li grounding line is retreating inwards because of, basal, because of the ice ocean interaction. And the results can or have been uh, other, other people, for example, Mililo et al. They also have seen this heterogeneous retreat of the grounding line. And for this talk, I'm not going to detail for that. And I don't go into processes. Why it's important, I show them the, the amount of mass loss over Antarctica during the period 1992 to 2017. And then I ask them to concentrate on like eight millimeters. It's cumulative. All you worry about that this trend is not go is not going up. It's still, we are just seeing that the trend in syllable uh, contribution is uh, we, it's increasing. That's the part that we worry about. I never end in a gloom and doom scenario. I will always end end my talk with lots of pictures and uh, photographs, and sometimes I include a little bit of art with it. And I'll take. I think I'll end there. That was amazing. All of these talks have been great. We have time for a couple of questions. We're going to take a five minute break after that. And I'd like to point out that one of the communications that I'm really loving is the chat where people have been so supportive. And I'm really loving the haikus that people have submitted. I think we should assemble all of them. And maybe we should even have, instead of a poster session, an art session at one of our future waste meetings. Does anyone have any questions for any of our three first set of speakers? Well, I have a couple, but um, I'm going to hold them off for the discussion. And let's take a five minute break. And if people want to ask a few questions during the break, I think that that would be wonderful. There's a, a comment about comments about audience interaction would be great. And actually, that's a really good one, too. Should I take it? 
Anyone oh, who wants to volunteer? Break. We're on break. Let's let's address a couple of questions during break. I know that I hate to take away the break, but we'll take a, a few extra minutes. Okay. So are we sorry, are we answering the question or I'm please confused. let's just take a minute or two and answer the question. Okay. Injani, did you want to take that or should I? Oh, I was confused that it was a question whether it was addressed to me or not. Yes, audience level, because this set of talk that I, the set of slides I showed you, I show it to people who understand the science and the and and the processes and the methods. If they're engineers, they would they would ask me about many like how how does the ocean get get inside the how how does the grounding zone retreat and what happens to the ice shelves are they still there or not? But the most important thing that I understand that some I often get and it's the common question is that oh thank you for sharing your slides and thank you for sharing your data. You know we understand that this pro Antarctica is so far and it's very hard to visualize what's actually going on there. So. That's something that moves me every time I give it, give an outreach talk. That's great, thanks. Let's take a five minute break. We'll come back at 2.42 Eastern and maybe we can talk a little bit more about audience interaction during the discussion section because I think that's a really important question. Okay, so I'm sure we'll have a few more people coming back. Um, but if we are ready, uh, Karen, are you here? Yes. Great. Yeah. Uh, so you should be able to start sharing your screen. Uh, and so while Karen does that, uh, happy to introduce Karen Romano Young, our next speaker talking about uh, comic heading to Antarctica and what came out of Antarctica is unknown. So intrigued, to say the least. <laughs> Okay, um, a science art comic artist went into Antarctica and what came out? Um, I'm a children's book author and illustrator. And um, in 2000, I had my first opportunity to go into a science lab. Um, I had written about scientists for years and figured out that I liked talking to them and writing about them more than anything else and wanted the opportunity to really find out more about them. I began to do books about them. And in 2003, I began to go into the field with them and to um, work on science communications and education outreach um, on their behalf. In 2017, I received an Antarctic Artist and Writers Grant from the National Science Foundation to go to Palmer Station with a team of scientists from the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences in Maine. Um, I was their lab assistant, um, and which was kind of unusual. I don't often get to get my hands dirty with science, but I was also there to document their work and to research a children's book. Um, the very first day after I received word about this grant, I found out that um, I had to go in PQ. And you all know what that is like. I'll come to that in a moment. Here we are at Palmer. Here's Palmer. So beautiful. And my way of finding out about things is to draw them. I like to draw first and ask questions later. I find out an awful lot about what goes on in a science setting by drawing instruments or labs or people doing things and then coming back to them later after I've already drawn some of my own conclusions and um, asking what everything is. So literally in this case, going all over the station to find out what all the things were that I had just drawn. This is something that I, I talk to kids a lot about. I have a big outreach on my own, getting kids to do science comics as a form of telling their science stories. Um, the technical stuff, yes. The nerdy stuff, yes. But also just whatever appeals to them about what happens in a science situation, which might not be the actual science, but might also draw them into the science. And that is kind of my secret is how can I draw you in with drawing? 
So here's the first comic that I did in my Antarctic log series, which is now close to 175 weeks and running, because I went to PQ and the phlebotomist asked me whether the global warming was coming through the hole in the ozone layer. Um, so here was an educated adult, um, a caring person who was interested, who just had this wrong idea. And I made that the first subject of my comic. Um, my comics are oriented toward the New York Times audience, which I learned when I worked at Scholastic for many years was 12 years old um, in terms of reading level and in terms of understanding of across the board information. So I, I always kind of try to bring people in from that perspective. What would be the first thing that a 12 year old would notice and what would pique their interest? Whether it's what we're wearing, this is the team from Bigelow. Um, or what we're, the kind of ship that we're on. This is a team, and I know some of you people in this picture are on this talk. Hello, Ruthie and Julia. Um, aboard the Joyetes Resolution um, was the next trip that I made to do science comics. There's Julia Wellner, larger than life, larger than the whole ship. Uh, bringing people aboard a very technical operation is something very interesting for science for a science comic artist drawing a lot of invisible stuff. But also, um, yeah, that's one superpower, drawing invisible stuff. But another superpower is feeling a little dumb about things. And I would say on the Joydees resolution for two months, I felt dumb about things. Um, <laughs> but had the opportunity to ask a lot of questions and do a lot of observations and do a lot of drawings and to turn around and say to general public, you don't need to feel dumb about this because this is all really interesting stuff that you're capable of understanding, whether it's because you see that it's a ship or you can see that there's whales or icebergs, all of these different things that draw people into wanting to know more about what you're doing. Um, you can even use a scientist figure as the basis for a comic. This is Karsten Gold's figure of a seismic profile of the sediment layers um, in the Amundsen Sea embayment and really being able to zero in from, even though we're lay people and understand what's going on in a sense, in a way, enough for me and maybe enough for them to really care about things and to get involved. This is always the big moment aboard the Joydees Resolution. Understanding this whole process, again, took me a long time, but being able to be there and to draw something and really look down and say what is actually going on and talk to people on either side and to draw it and then to go back and to find out what's going on to try and make a representational a representative scene of something that's going on even though it's not necessarily what appeared before me but to show things and to explain them in a way that makes people think, well, I don't exactly understand everything about this, but I get what's going on is always my, always my goal. Um, we did a very simple couple of comics that went into print, um, a little uh, fold out in order to hand to people at uh, National Science Teachers Association, National Council of Teachers of English, other places where there were teachers who were going to be bringing science materials back to kids. And this comic in particular was an interesting opportunity because we were able to translate it with the help of scientists on board into every single language that was spoken aboard. This is Dutch, this is Hindi, as well as a few others that we added because we thought that our audience would be interesting. So here's a few places that you might not think of as audiences for your, um, for your science, but my comics have um, appeared in Science Friday Education with the Antarctic Science. Um, the scientists obviously use it for their own outreach. The National Council of Teachers of English included an essay about my experience doing comics in Antarctica. Um, in a big compendium of writing by nonfiction authors for kids who are learning to write nonfiction, science teachers, Smithsonian Ocean Portal. My own website makes all of this material available for free to educators through Creative Commons, um, which is a set of rights. AGU, 
Muse Magazine is a award-winning magazine for children sharing science, and I sponsor a science comic contest that brings in hundreds of comics um, once a year. The deadline is October 31st this year, um, and last year we had winners from um, the U.S. and the U.K., and I take my comics into schools, um, both virtually and in person, social media, and I actually have my own hallway at the USAP that's got comics all up and down it. So they're, they come into, wind up in a lot of unexpected places. This is my AGU poster, which um, gets attention just because it's so different looking from other AGU posters. Um, this is all the science that we did on the JR and the comics that I did um, while I was out there for two months. There have been additional ones. Uh, that came after. So my, my message to you to finish with is to please consider bringing somebody who is basically an outsider into your science experience because I can provide doors, windows um, to audiences who we hope might be inspired to go into these fields in the future as well as those who are voting now and um, helping establish policy, being active about the causes that are also important to us comic contest, tell somebody you know. And I'm finishing with a new comic that I've got underway called I Was a Kid, which is designed to bring, um, to, to show kids in middle school and high school pathways that people have taken into the sciences. This is Carrie Nelson, who's a research station administrator at Palmer. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, that was fantastic. So uh, we're a little short on time. So I think we'll uh, have questions for Karen in the discussion section. Uh, we have one more talk and then I'm sure we'll have a very lively discussion session uh, after that. So uh, next up we have Peter Neff and title of his talk is Antarctica's Adventure in Social Media. So I'm sure we're gonna see some ice falling down a hole. Look at that. Uh, very predictable. Let's see here. Everybody, does that look all right, everybody? I forgot to mention Peter. Jeremy is keeping time, so he'll flash five fingers and two fingers up on the video. Okay, great. Does it look all right, Apologies. everybody? Does that look good? Okay, great. Hey, so I'm Peter Neff. For those who don't know me, I'm uh, newly a research professor at, at the University of Minnesota. Um, I am an ice core scientist, so that's sort of where I come from in, in sharing my work. And I just wanted to share with you what I've been doing uh, in, and learning very quickly in social media over the last, uh, mostly in the last three years, um, sharing things that go viral. And, and uh, I also just wanted to sort of just talk about my, my thoughts of the utility of um, platforms like uh, Twitter and, and how TikTok, which I've, uh, I was recruited to, to experiment with this year. Um, which are really productive. So first I'll start with the, tori uh, the story of this um, fantastic video of us dropping ice down a pure ice borehole at Taylor Glacier back in 2016. Uh, that, that really has captured a lot of attention and uh, because of how fantastic it is. So uh, this video, it just sort of has become like a hook for uh, attracting people to, to science. But when I posted this on Twitter back in 2018, it went mega viral. It's been uh, viral a couple of times and covered all over the place. So I had to learn really quickly how to deal with uh, this sort of an experience and licensing requests, working with media outlets. Um, the first thing we did after this was posted and got attention, it was of course we, we scienced the heck out of it. And uh, working with a colleague at the University of Rochester, we wrote about the acoustics of what makes this weird noise of ice falling down a borehole, five page PDF on it, you can look it up. Um, but more importantly, it was covered widely, including in the Japanese uh, media. And my, my Japanese translation voice is much more masculine than, than I am myself. Um, so, this has been an example for me of, of just how people are, are basically fascinated with uh, some of these really unique experiences that many of us have had in, in Antarctica in our work. And, and certainly it's a uh, way to bring them into the, the important science that we're doing, right? Dropping, dropping a piece of ice down a hole is not why I got into social media and, and what I'm trying to share, but it's a way to, to draw people in. Um, 
this also resurfaced again earlier this year when, when John Higgins posted a video from the Allen Hills of a very similar effect. Um, so I think Austin Carter's on the call here and uh, he was uh, right here recording this video. And of course, I've gotten a lot of credit again for this video, which, which is not mine. And I've tried to duly credit uh, the folks at Princeton, but um, you know, social media runs off ahead of you sometimes. Um, so if I run out of time or, or if I don't uh, get through everything, I just want to leave you with my messages is share your science. Our science in, in waste glaciology is really unique, timely, and societally relevant. Um, sharing it on any social media platform engages people that you would not otherwise engage. And it, it, it opens you to real life opportunities. And an example of that for me, just because of my online presence over the years, uh, I've, I've done everything from you know, all sorts of media interviews, but then also consulting uh, Hulu television shows starring Sean Penn. I got a random email from producers asking what, how we deal with ice cores in Antarctica and what it looks like. I think they wanted me to say that we use whiz -bang computers and all this fancy stuff. And I was like, oh, well, we use a pencil and a ruler and, we, uh, and that's how we, we log our cores. So this is uh, our depiction of an Antarctic ice core scientist purely based on my, uh, I think really letting them down that uh, you know, this is a soon to be astronaut in the field and this is what we do with ice cores. So I may not have represented our community great here, uh, but this is the sort of thing that I have stumbled into through, through putting myself out on social media. And I think uh, many of, of you all could do it uh, similar to me or, or better than I can do. Um, one of the most fantastic things about this is I was credited for, for as a technical consultant on the same list as Chris Hadfield, the, the fantastic astronaut. So uh, it's weird the things that can happen to you if you put yourself out there. Um, so not everybody's gonna go viral, why should you bother? Um, so I think like all grad students certainly should consider having a Twitter presence. Um, it allows you to push your ideas, your work, your information out there rather than hope that it's pulled in when you publish a paper and, and that might be uptaken in, in popular media, science media. You can share your, your research in, in bite-sized um, pieces. So think about how you're, you're tweeting and sharing about a new paper or a new result so that it's self-contained in a tweet that somebody else might want to share because they find it interesting and, and that sort of can help uptake of your information. Um, Twitter is a great platform to support, advise and encourage uh, our peers and, and certainly junior folks and underrepresented folks in our community discuss challenges in, in the academic community particular and barriers to, to folks getting in, folks progressing. You can reach outside of your name, it, um, your university, your country, your discipline, and you certainly um, can, can much more easily interact with science journalists if you have a presence there. And that, I mean, it's true for me, and I'm sure there are others who have had similar experiences. Um, in the interest of time, I'll keep moving. So that's all I'll say about Twitter. And I think the rest I'll sort of focus on TikTok because I found it to be a fantastically <laughs> Bizarre experience since I started using it uh, in, in April this year. I, I have 130,000 followers um, from nothing. Uh, it's not just people dancing on this app. So it's a short format video sharing app. It's grown from 10 million users two years ago to more than 100 million users now, especially um, during all the lockdowns that, that we're experiencing globally. Um, and their educational content is growing. So there's a really big audience there. It, it's a young audience. Um, half of their users are between 18 and 34 years old. Um, and in my experience, I've found, I don't think there, there's anything particularly special about my content besides that, that I have videos from Antarctica. Um, but folks are eager for engaging factual information that's coming from an expert. Um, so how I got to TikTok was actually through Instagram, which is all I'll say about Instagram. I, I have a presence there. And I was contacted by a talent agent uh, to, to um, start using TikTok for their creative learning fund, which they started earlier this year um, in a, a conscious effort to boost educational content during the lockdown, uh, acknowledging that there are so many students who would otherwise be in school who are now just online. And so trying to fill that, that vacuum somehow. And so that's identified with this hashtag learn on TikTok, which is still a community that they're fostering. And, and I'm still uh, partnered with TikTok through the end of the year to, to keep contributing to that community. Um, and of course, just there's a lot in the news about TikTok. It's, it's uh, similar to all social media platforms. It has uh, some serious privacy and, and content issues um, that they are working to address and that you should consider before you, you use it. But uh, it, for our purposes, it, it's the same as Facebook, Twitter, any of these other platforms. Um, just as a bit of a how-to, so here's a little video of me putting you know, some great folks doing their TikTok and, and how I would quickly put together a video. If you record in the field or the lab or whatever you're doing, uh, model animations, three to 10 second long clips that you can string together in a story. 
Um, I do it all on an iPhone 7, uh, which I always have on me in the field. So I found that to be the easiest thing. Um, stitch those clips together to tell a story. You know, single piece of information is great. Treat those posts as an experiment. We're scientists and you can learn what works. And certainly, you know, it's a vertical video platform. They, they um, have a magical algorithm that if you, if you tick the right boxes, you will get more uptake on their platform. Um, but I would say that because we as scientists have, have this unique credi credibility and a deep level of understanding of, of the topics we might share about, we can really share things in ways that, that can't be replicated uh, by, by university communications folks and, and social media managers. So we do need to be out there doing this stuff, representing our science. Um, I just wanted to share with you some of the, the metrics that I have, and, and um, I know that I'm already sort of short on time, so I'll try to move quickly. You get analytics anytime you use a social media platform. So you should look at them and we should share them and include them um, as we're justifying the use of these platforms and proposals. So I, in the last month, have had more than 2 million video views. That's after a bit of a blip, of course, from strategic use of the ice drop video. Uh, I, my following has, has grown, you know, it's hundreds of new followers per day. Um, and my followers are mostly in the US, but um, you can see the breakdown there. Compare that to you know, the paper I wrote for my master's uh, project back in 2012. It's been cited 18 times, uh, maybe read 100 times per research gate, if you believe that. Um, so right, our information is getting out there. It's not a peer-reviewed TikTok document, but it's, it's science getting out to uh, people who wouldn't otherwise see it. So here's some examples of what I've produced and, and how they've been uptaken. So this video was posted uh, in mid-May. It's been viewed 2 million times. It's about ice core science. Like I would never have expected that that would happen. Um, but TikTok is great because you can make these little captions to include great information. You can um, talk over your videos. And, and in doing that, using those tools that TikTok provides you for the videos, that's how you get more uptake in, in their algorithm. And you end, on people, end up on people's, uh, the front page of people's apps. Um, you know, simple videos of the experiences we have in Antarctica really seem to engage people, right? This video has two and a half million views. 4,000 comments, and these are real substantive comments, it's a, a, a fair amount of them. So um, I get tons of questions through this, people asking how to work in Antarctica, and I try to respond to as many as I can. I get way more than I can actually respond to, though. It's, it's been incredible. Um, so I'll, I'll skip through um, just to the wrap up here quickly. We have some great examples in our community of, of folks doing awesome things on Twitter. Joe Johnson did a great job last year as part of the Thwaites Project out in the Hudson Mountains tweeting from the middle of nowhere, her and a field guide, uh, which is just an incredible story for people to see. I hope she does it again and, and can get even broader uptake. Um, so we have this unique content that if you do a little bit of work to get it out there, it, it really um, can get a lot of uptake in my experience. Um, and I've, I've started real collaborations. I wrote a, fel a fellowship application with Joe just from our interactions on Twitter. Um, Steph Lermit, of course, is awesome on Twitter with his satellite image, his satellite animations. Kaya, I saw your, your advertisement for the Waste Workshop a couple of days ago. You blow up stuff in Antarctica. If you have video of that and share it uh, you know, in intentional ways and, and attach that to some science, people are really going to take that up. So, uh, And then, of course, Seth Campbell jumping down inside Thwaites Glacier. Uh, how can you not love that? So I think you know, these, these things have been seen by people. They'd get much wider uptake if we could. So I know I'm sorry I'm going over time, but um, I wanted in presenting this to just sort of push us towards these these points here. I want us to normalize social media use as a credible um, way to achieve unique broader impacts, um, a way that we can have social media included as work, um, things that are really considered when we're applying for jobs or tenure and promotion. Um, we should, as a community, keep thinking about how we share um, our work on social media, including live from Antarctica. I think that's really becoming much more possible. And we should always spread the values of our um, science, our socially relevant, science and the values of our research community. So only use social media for good, pull people up, share and discuss your science and the struggles of being a scientist, um, but always lift up other people. So thanks so much for, for having me. Thanks, Peter. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers and our audience as well, who've been amazingly supportive. And I still, I see the haikus keep on coming in and I, I really do, <laughs> I really love it. Um, this has been one of the best sessions I've attended at WACE in a very long time. And so the tradition of WACE is now that we open up as a panel discussion to talk more broadly about science communication. And 
the panel is there to help moderate the discussion and to help focus it. But I think I'd like to open it up to the entire community that's here so that we can have a productive conversation about science communication. And there's a couple of themes in the talks that, that really struck me. And one is the amazing ways in which people are using storytelling in different media, using visual media, cartoons, telling stories, using classical story structure, and, um, and apparently using TikTok, which I don't really know what that is, but I also don't even have a Facebook account, much less a Twitter account. And I find social media to be a terrifying landscape that I'm reluctant to engage in. It is terrifying. So Jared, and, we need to talk. We need to get you on Twitter at least. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't even know how to tweet. So that will be my my next step is going to be to try and find a Twitter account, um, probably my own, I guess. Um, so let me let's open it up to questions. And there was a question from Christina that she posed and unfortunately wasn't able to attend the discussion. But what she was interested in is how you engage your audience in participation and in our discussions. So this is especially true in the Zoom era, right? And those of us who teach classes, we teach to students and sometimes we don't even have video. And so getting those students to interact with us, getting the public to interact with us is can be a challenge. So I'd like to open up to the panel and to the rest of the audience. How do we get better interaction with students? What are the techniques you use? Christina had a great example of writing Antarctica on a whiteboard and then asking what emotions that evokes is a way of getting some insight and getting people to start talking. We're all stopped. I'll go. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody else to answer first. Um, okay, I'll go first and others can join in. Um, how do, in the Zoom era, the re most recent talk that I have given was with the Columbia Alumni Association and my target was K-12. So Lamont advertised, I asked, Lamont, I asked the Columbia Alumni Association to advertise that the kids should draw Antarctic animals they look up Antarctica and they try and find the animals they like and the birds they like and they should send to me. And amazingly, people did send the students, the children, some of them were as, as little as five years old. A lot of animals to interact with the older uh, this more experienced people it's it's just using a, a little bit more complicated art which makes them which makes them understand you know get, get them thinking about the process and then connect that to data and go really slow and then show a lot of field, field pictures about things happening in action things in action people uh, working or even how do we spend our leisure time? So I get questions like that. So if I weave them in between the story, in between the message that I want to convey, it becomes, a, it goes, I think it flows better. I'll stop at that and let somebody else talk. Yeah, I, I, I'll go next. I totally agree with everything Indrani just said. Um, some of the methods that I've used is like having a mascot. This is Bob Tross. We actually had a, um, we invited schools all around the world to, to name him for our last expedition and we came up with Bob Truss. The Americans will know why that that's amusing. Um, the other thing we did is shrunken cups. Um, I took like 250 cups from school children in my local town. Um, they, they got to, you know, draw in the cups. So things like that that are really kid-friendly kid or everyone-friendly activities. I find when I'm actually doing talks and stuff, it's really not that hard to engage people because like I said, it's Antarctica, it's super cool. You're a badass for even being there. People want to know about it. They want to know what it's like to actually um, to be on an Antarctica. What's the living conditions like? You know, just the basic things of how you, um, how you survive on a ship or how you survive, like, you know, when you're there, how cold it is. So I think just, just everyday things, what's the food like? People are always gonna be really 
um, engaged by, by that basic stuff too. I'd like to add, um, going back to my scholastic perspective, because I used to write about every topic and I, I fell in love with writing about scientists because not only did they have the most exciting lives, but they were the most excited about everything that they did. And even though they were doing brilliant complex things, if I said to them, look, I'm gonna have to go back and explain this to fourth graders, they could back it up and they would listen and they still listen. If I say, here's what I think you're saying, how, how close have I got? to it. In terms of talking to audiences, that's an incredible tool for me to be able to talk about what they do with such enthusiasm, with such passion for life. But it's also important to me to convey my own difficulty in communicating it, which can sometimes be that I'm bored, which really means not engaged. So I have to keep on going until I find something that is engaging to me, whether it's an image or an animal. And to encourage audiences to find that thing. You know, is it a polar bear that's out on the ice or is it, what is that machine that is in the corner that I can't quite see? Um, so to create situations where people can ask questions about what, what involves them. And then lastly, to never assume. I was in a school one time where the answer to the question was bioluminescence. And the children who had the answer were four years old. And <laughs> someone had taught them something that was interesting to them about glowing fish. And um, to always kind of look for that little sparkle in somebody's eye that tells you that they're engaged. Those are all great suggestions. And, and other contributions? We have, we have some really great questions in the comments too. I have, I have a bit of an answer that maybe is controversial, which is that, so, from the how do you get your audience to engage perspective. I actually think that, that you can make meaningful contributions in sharing science and not address the responses back towards you. Um, I, like Jeremy, am scared of social media. I don't use it in my personal life um, and I try and spend very little time on it. And so the way I treat my social media science communication is like a one-way street where I push out content and then I kind of don't look at the response that it receives and I don't <laughs> engage in answers back to it. Um, and that is like what protects my brain in, in this like social media landscape. Um, and so I would encourage folks who are similar to me in not wanting to like have social media be a big presence in their lives to still contribute on that platform and just treat it like you're, you're pushing stuff out there. And, and the nice thing is, is that that actually doesn't take a lot of time. I think that a lot of the time of SciComm that people associate with it from a social media perspective actually comes from the like absorbing other people's content. And so like one way to really minimize like the, your own perception of how much time SciComm takes is just to focus on producing content and not as strongly engaging with the responses that you get back. I'd love to hear what the other panelists think about that because yeah. I realize this is I, I controversial. Think, I think I agree with you. And especially, you know, you, if, if it is a tactic to protect yourself, it's, that's absolutely Awesome, but I mean, I think I, it's in in this weird context of social media. It's totally fine to have that one way where you're at least you're putting your information out there because before it wasn't out there at all. And, and I mean, I think of like putting my videos on TikTok, like you're it's a sneak attack on somebody who's, you know, flipping through silly videos on TikTok, and all of a sudden this this thing, one with a little bit more substance, uh, I like to think, comes along. And so so that. I think is totally fine as well. There, there is interaction on, if you want it on some of these platforms, um, you know, generating a following, asking them what they want to see or responding to the comments they make about uh, the things they want to see, which tend to be the things that, that they can connect to their lives. What's it like inside of your tent? How do you go to the bathroom in Antarctica? And so you can still do those things and still attach a little bit of science to them. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. And it, it certainly is a very scary environment and, and I guess I feel like I can enter that social media environment in a very different way as a cisgendered white straight man than than a lot of other folks out there and so I so you know and I can only represent and have my experience because of of who I am but it's just sort of putting yourself out there in a way I mean I'm a very sort of shy reserved person so I I don't understand why I'm the person who's doing a lot of social media but you know the biggest thing I struggle with in in my science is confidence but social media, you, you know, you produce stuff and we have these experiences that just sort of stand on their own when you put them out to people. 
You know, I'm going to just um, tack something onto what Peter just said. You know, I'm a naturally shy person too, but, you know, having social media creates a natural barrier between you and the audience. It's why so many internet trolls are out there because they don't have to, like, you know, interact if they don't want to. They can say any shit that they, sorry, you know, they can say anything negative that they want that, and, you know, not necessarily have to, to deal with it. But, you know, at the very... the any little bit of social media is better than no social media. If you're a scientist, in my opinion, it gives some way for people to connect with you. I, I, there's nothing more frustrating to me. I read a paper and the first thing I do, if I'm interested in what the persons or the people have written, I go to Twitter and I see if they have a profile there to see if I can connect with them and communicate with them and at least just like see what they're doing. It's it's so frustrating to get there or any social media and find that they have no presence. I'm like, what are you doing? Why do you think? Why are you not at least having a profile so that you can follow what other people are doing? So you can support your peers in this space. You can amplify their message at the very least. You don't have to post anything yourself. At the very least, amplify what your peers are sharing. There's no, I mean, please. You, need, you, you want tips on how to do it? Just contact me, I'll, I'll talk you through it. Uh, so maybe. we have a comment that is related to this um, for Bob and Val, which is really, you talked a little bit about Peter, and I think a lot of, uh, of the other speakers talked about lifting people up. And we also have this persistent problem of we are not a very diverse community in the polar sciences. And if we think about diversity broadly, then I also think about people who have various disabilities, um, I think about this a lot in my classes, and I'd like to engage with the entire panel on how we can communicate our stories so that we get a broader set of people interested in what we're doing and can start to diversify our communities. Is that, is social media the right avenue for that? Are there strategies that we can use? Are there other avenues that we should be looking at? I mean, I could start with some some answers to various of those points, but um, you know, something I consciously try to do, and I think if we all acknowledge and agree that that we have these issues in our community and, and need to address uh, issues of of justice, equity, inclusion, uh, diversity, um, you know, we we can use I, I try to use my platform to to bring up those people so I guess ways I'm thinking of that are like if I see a science journalist who's asking for an opinion on something I will I, I try to have in my mind a, a list of, of junior colleagues or less represented colleagues or female colleagues that I can put their names out there and, and I know that one more white dude's voice is not really needed in that situation and knowing giving those any of those people the the credit that they are going to be able to answer it just as well as I can, even though they'll answer whatever requests differently than I would. Um, so, so certainly doing that. I mean, I, I know that in the way that I share on social media, I, I emphasize field work a lot. And that's in part because of my experience and, and my work has been much more field based than, than a lot of folks, but that does bring up issues of, of accessibility. And um, I guess one way that, that I would hope to, to be addressing that soon is to start highlighting the ways that that we do science without ever leaving home maybe especially you know as on a sort of a, a COVID-19 theme but right like these NASA people fly satellites over Antarctica and the folks who work with those data right I mean it's all just streaming in and it's all just ones and zeros and you get this fantastic perspective on an entire continent that you can't get any other way and you don't have to leave home to do it besides maybe to launch a satellite and that sort of thing but um yeah it's it, it's tricky and I, I acknowledge that my how my social media use it heavily emphasizes field work which is which is often ableist and uh, I'm trying to address that oh yeah Emily's question was really good too and I guess I would hope that those of us who, who are a little further along the career track we are modeling the behavior that we want to see credited as um, you know getting credit for for social media um, outreach, that sort of thing in the professional context. I think it's a real way to contact people, to reach people. So I'm using it, I'm including it in proposals. I'm you know, tracking the analytics and treating it as a, a real product, um, that I, the product that I think it is. And you know, it may still be challenging for me to convince my colleagues in my department that it should count uh, in my tenure and promotion and that sort of thing. But 
Um, one way I think that we can support earlier career scientists is by modeling that um, you know, treatment of, of social media as a serious, serious way to connect with people. I want to mention that Twitter I have found to be particularly deep and rich in terms of figuring out who's involved in science. There are groups that people have put together and hashtags, um, black girls that code, um, minorities in polar research that I have been using as a resource to find people um, to write about, to talk with, to interview, because I have a personal goal of inclusion and diversity in who I show in my work, um, particularly with the new comic that I'm doing, I was a kid, to show those pathways. So these things can actually really be tools to finding people. And I want to answer Emily's question as well, that many of the speakers noted science communication takes a lot of time. I completely agree with it. And you know, my personal experience has been that uh, an effective science communication talk took me several iterations to get it right. Like I look at the audience, I gauge their, uh, what they are thinking and the steps that I missed and I put it back again and the next time I'm putting more information and trimming it. So it takes a lot of iterations. And the art thing, the STEM involvement that, I, that I'm doing right now actually could happen because, of, because I am at home and all my other hobbies has been taken out. I'm an outdoorsy person. I can't get to anywhere. So what do I do? I paint something and I like it and I put it in a talk and people like it. I just kept on adding to it. And then I got involved with, uh, collaborated with my sister who is also at home. So, you know, it does take a lot of time and effort and, uh, we start to, we are in the NSF proposals, we do include some outreach activities in our proposal uh, to put in as a broader impacts, like giving talks or organizing workshops. I think that it's time that we also took a bigger look at how we can engage with the artists and how in our proposals, how we can put those workshops together, which brings together mm -hmm. people other disciplines um, and it gets written in our proposals and then it is reviewed favorably based on that light. Yeah, just, yeah. just to add on to that um, for Emily's question, um, like early career benefits and how do we like incentivize that? And um, I just would add also that even if the like formal academic structure doesn't go to your Twitter account and look for you know, how many followers you have or whatever, that the benefits that come from sharing your science seep into your science, that like you build collaborations and um, get invited to give talks in science communication sessions. And that like, mm -hmm. there can be these very tangible benefits that like end up on your CV and will impact the hiring committees that come through social media involvement. And um, like, at least for me at this point, that's enough to like justify putting time into it. And I hope that down the road that um, you know, the hiring committees of the world will look at your audience that you're reaching through your communication in the internet space. But even if that doesn't happen, they'll notice the publications that I have that have come through it. Mm. Just, just to follow up on Kaya's uh, comment quickly, I can trace a direct path from things that happened because I was on Twitter to the job I have today. Like, I, I, I am a person who is in his job right now, in part because of his social media use. So uh, just to give Emily some good news, um, it can have a, a big impact on the trajectory of your career. Yeah, I, I'd second what, what Matt said. And, and I, it's, it's tough. I mean, I, as a person who's kind of now left the early career and more into the mid career, um, you know, I was kind of in this transition of pre Twitter and post Twitter. And, you know, it, I, I resisted it for many years and there are many benefits and I think what it really comes down to are those of us that are, you know, perhaps close to my age or my career status and more senior, where we have to start acknowledging on hiring committees, the benefits and the, the real, you know, the real impact that our ability to communicate has with people beyond our scientific colleagues, but people in, in a broader audience. Can I just add, um, you know, based, you know, going off what Indrani said, you know, 
or you can always outsource people like me and Karen and Kev we really want to work with you guys you know we're passionate about this we're sitting through all these things about you know I sat and, and fern and everything else it's because we're really really excited about what you guys are doing and we want to translate your science for you so don't be afraid to kind of reach out to people that are creative and have these sort of science communication ideas and want to want to work with you we're here this has been a great session and we're running out of time but we have one last question that i would like to address um, and it is from someone who's been working a lot on SciComm, but hasn't had maybe the high impact of however millions of, of, of TikTok followers that you've had, Peter. And it was related to another question that we had earlier about not doing lab or field work might seem to be a little bit less uh, viral. And I would like us to think about that question a little bit. Yeah, that's a tough question, and, and I don't I don't know that I have a, a clear answer besides that I guess we all need to constantly be uh, thinking about why we are using social media and and um, evaluating, you know, how things are going and and what that still means for your original in, intent on social media. So you know, if you're using it um, to to try to benefit your career and, and you're finding that there's not not uptake. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really know what what to say about that. But it, I mean, it sounds like th this person's experience maybe it is useful in, in the the conference setting and um, for networking. And so that sort of I think is a is a fundamental um, use of of social media platforms. But yeah, that's really tricky. I mean, I guess I got I'll just in in the spirit of of sharing intentions, I guess one of my, the things that, um, you know, as like a mental health thing that I get from using social media as well is, is I feel like I get to share some of what I go through personally on these really long um, science projects that, that are, are a big, you know, a big memory and a big experience in my life, even though they're, you know, on the whole, not a huge amount of time in my life, but they're this very intense experience. And so I share them to sort of process that experience, which, which takes uh, years. So um, that's that's not really answering the question, but maybe others have good perspective. Um, just what I typed into the chat, which was um, make yourself visible. Um, journalists, um, storytellers are looking for characters. Storytellers are looking for stories to tell. Um, those of us who are outreach people, we don't come into this with our own story of Antarctica to tell, whether we're there or in the lab. Um, we are looking for what you have to say. But if we can't find you, we can't write about you. He here. <laughs> and I'd also say that science communication is a very broad field and having um, millions of TikTok viewers is one way of gaining visibility. But there's other things that are maybe less visible that are having impact as well. Um, interacting with local communities because communities are currently making plans to deal with sea level rise. They're dealing with things like zoning issues. And so being a presence in some of these decisions and in some of these communities and helping planning happen is something that we have not as a community prioritized for the most part. Um, and so also sharing perspectives from different diverse perspectives because not all of us are gonna to go to the field every season and drop things down holes, right? Um, there's a whole part of science that's interesting and fun that goes, that's almost tangent to that, that interacts with it, but you know, different people might have different interests. And I think we are about out of time. I'll, I'd like to actually keep the discussion going for a little bit longer, but I recognize a lot of you guys have other places to go and I've already taken up more of your time. so. I would really like to thank all of the panelists and everyone who showed up for this session. This has been um, one of the most fun sessions that I've been to in ways in a really long time. I thought we had some really great perspectives and I'm thrilled with the, with the talks we had. I've learned so much and I'm going to try and sign up for Twitter after this. <laughs> Brave man.
Thank you. I, Thank I you, do Jeremy. think for, you know, for anybody signing up for Twitter, it's a great way to keep keep your you know, get a sense of the pulse of and the health of of you know the smaller research communities like ours, and also in, in STEM and academia in general. It's it's really good for keeping track of how folks are doing. Jeremy, I just joined recently, so it's good. You should go for it. And I would love to hear I'll propose to waste managers that we uh, have a art uh, session at the next waste meeting. Yes, noted. I would just like to reiterate that I have a step-by-step -step guide of how to use Twitter. If you're a scientist, so just contact me if you would like me to send that to you. Yeah, yeah, and of course we're all talking as as more, or you know, speaking for myself, I guess, it's talking as a scientist doing science communication. But science communication is a field of research. It is not something that we all need to reinvent every time. So we didn't really cover that, but um, you know, there are a, a lot of folks out there who. Um, really know, know much more and have actual scientific papers about how, how to best do this and um, mm. so. Thanks everyone, thanks for coming. Thanks and everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.